chapter 9, Antibiotics. This is a long chapter, but it's an important chapter, so you guys will do great. Antibiotics are defined as chemicals that inhibit specific bacteria. It can be made through living microorganisms, synthetic manufacturers, or through genetic engineering. New medications are continuously created due to resistance of existing drugs from the microorganisms. When we give patients antibiotics, the patient presents with signs of infection, which are, include fever, lethargy, classic signs of inflammation, which include, but not limited to, redness, swelling, and pain. When the patient presents with an infection, we need to decide what type of antibiotic they receive. This is due identifying through a culture and gram stain sensitivity. And we can determine if they are bacteriostatic or bacteriocidial. When we have bacteria and antibiotics, we need to identify which antibiotics treat which bacteria. First of all, when we do a gram stain, we need to see if it's positive or gram negative. If it retains the stain with alcohol during the culture and sensitivity, we know that this is gram positive. When it's gram negative, cell walls lose the stain and are decolorized by the alcohol during the culture and sensitivity. Aerobic bacteria depends on oxygen for survival, while anaerobic doesn't use oxygen. And each of these antibiotics we talk about discusses if they treat gram positive or gram negative bacteria. The goal of antibiotic therapy is to decrease the population of the invading bacteria to a point where the human immune system can effectively deal with the invader. Antibiotics are sometimes given in combination together because they are synergistic. They combine the effect which is greater together than individually. An antibiotic we can think of as Bactrim DS. With pregnant women, you shouldn't take antibiotics unless the benefits outweigh the risk. Antibiotics can also interfere with effectiveness of hormonal contraceptives, which leads to unplanned pregnancies. When the physician is identifying the correct antibiotic for treatment, they must identify the causative agent. And we have already discussed this. This is based on the culture and sensitivity report that's been given. They've already discussed the bacteria classification, but you need to remember that bacteria have survived for hundreds of years. And the longer an antibiotic has been an antibiotic, the greater the chance that that bacteria becomes resistant to the, that type of antibiotic. Also remember that some antibiotics are used prophylactically. Sometimes we give antibiotics preoperatively before surgery to prevent an infection. We do that with like total knee and total hip patients. Also in the community, we give patients with heart histories or have had prior heart surgeries. We give them antibiotics prior to having dental work done. Aminoglycosides is a group of powerful antibiotics used to treat serious infections caused by gram-negative aerobic bacillus. The common ones we see today are gentamicin, streptomycin, and tobramycin. When you're giving your aminoglycosides like gentamicin, that's treating serious infections. They inhibit protein synthesis of gram-negative bacteria, which leads to cell death. These are very potent antibiotics with serious toxicities. These antibiotics are often used in combination with other antibiotics. Each antibiotic, including aminoglycoside, which I'll talk about in a minute, discusses the pharmacokinetics. You don't necessarily need to do need this, but I'm leaving this on for your knowledge to read over. And sometimes it does have important information. So remember, this is um, aminoglycosides. They do cause renal toxicity, so they need to have good kidney function to excrete the aminoglycosides.
With aminoglycosides, we don't want to give these to patients who have renal or hepatic disease or hearing loss because the adverse effect of aminoglycosides like gentamicin causes ototoxicity and they'll have dizziness, tinnitus, and possibly hearing loss. They can also experience nephrotoxicity. It's common. They also may complain of central nervous system effects of a headache and paresthesia along with their ototoxicity. Aminoglycosides have an impact on other drug inhibits. So if we're giving tobramycin, it can have an effect on the when it, if they take it with a diuretic like furosemide or also known as Lasix, it increases the incidence of ototoxicity. It can also have effects on blood if you're on a blood thinner. And when we give our patients aminoglycosides, we want to assess for allergies all the time. We want to assess a physical assessment focusing on renal and hepatic history and if they have any previous hearing loss. We want to do an orientation because it can impact their central nervous system. Assess vital signs. We want to monitor the drug levels with aminoglycosides. You can do peaks and troughs. So we want to make sure that they're at a safe level when receiving this medication. These prototypes are also in your book. And it just reinforces much what I've said. So remember, they can have dizziness, r rash, fever, and with gentamicin, they're at risk for nephrotoxicity. Carbapenems. Are a newer class of broad spectrum antibiotics that are effective against gram positive and gram negative. Typically, ones you'll see are N bands, Promaxin, used at Hannibal Regional. When we give Promaxin, it's used for treatment of bone, joint, skin, and soft tissue infections. Carbapenems, when they first came out, had um, fatal GI toxicities, but newer car. Newer carbapenems are, don't, are not as toxic. These drugs are often given parentally and they're often ra rapidly absorbed through this body. Carbapenems contraindications. We want to assess for any allergies including penicillins, cephalosporins. We also need to assess if they have any seizure disorders because it has an effect on electrolytes imbalance. Also, it affects them when we give them a drug-to-drug -drug interaction. If we give a carbapenem and valproic acid together, it can increase their, increase their chance for seizures because it causes the decreases the level of valproic acid. We also don't want to give this to pregnant or lactating mothers. And we don't want to use this medication in children less than eight. Nursing considerations for patients receiving carbapenem, such as ertampamin or Envans or Permaxin. We want to assess those allergies. We want to do a good physical assessment with a focus on the GI system. We want to make sure they're orientated and they have a good intact central nervous system since they are at risk for seizures. We also want to assess the renal function because we want to use this cautiously because it's excreted through the urine. So we also need to test their urine function. Cephalosporins are similar to penicillins, which we'll talk about a little later. Common medications you'll see I've highlighted on this slide. You'll see Keflex or Cephalaxin. You'll see cefazolin, which is a second generation antibiotic for cephalosporins. Um, you'll see some ceftiner or ceftriaxone, which is also known as recephin. And these are similar to penicillin. So if our patient has a penicillin allergy, 
We want to know what caused the penicillin allergy and what the patient experienced when they say they're allergic to it because they have similar restriction, so they may also have allergic reaction to cephalosporins. When giving cephalosporins, we know they're similar to penicillin, so we know they're going to treat gram-positive bacteria along with gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negatives gram are E. coli. Um, second generations are more effective against gram-positive bacteria. And our fourth generation drugs, they are even effective against methicillin resistant organisms such as your MRSA. As I mentioned earlier, um, we also need to be aware of that potential cross sensitivity with penicillins if an allergy exists. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And that should be on if you're writing down um, your nursing action on your med sheets should be if you're writing down Keflex, you need to write down assess penicillin allergy. When we are taking care of our patients, they're gonna have some adverse effects. Most significantly we see is the GI tract. They'll experience nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. They may also experience some anorexia. They can have some central nervous system symptoms such as headache, dizziness. They also are seen to have nephrotoxicity, but this is most particular with patients who have predisposed renal insufficiency. So a healthy 30-year-old is not going to have the chance of nephrotoxicity like an 85-year-old patient on dialysis. We also need to teach our patients who are taking cephalosporins to avoid alcohol for up to 72 hours after taking the entire dose of cephalosporins. Also, when patients are taking oral anticoagulants, they, the blood is already thinned by the anticoagulant, so they may have increased bleeding time, so we need to educate our patient to watch for signs and symptoms of bleeding. So if they fall on the street, and they take warfarin, which is a blood thinner, their bleeding time's already increased, but this is gonna increase it when they go to the hospital, so they might need a head CT scan. Nursing considerations for patients receiving cephalosporins. We wanna assess for any possible contraindications or cautions. Do they have a known allergy to penicillin? We wanna perform a thorough physical assessment. Um, we want to do renal function tests because we want to use this cautiously with renal impairment. We want to educate our patients to take the oral dose with food to decrease the GI distress. When we give cephalosporins IM, a lot of time we'll give IM rocephin. We'll mix it with lidocaine because when we give the injection, it's painful. And we're going to educate our patient to drink lots of fluid to stay hydrated. Chloroquinolones are a relatively new class of antibiotics with a broad spectrum of activity. Common medications we see today are superflaxin, Levofloxacin and Um, The last one you see a lot, I think, with eardrops. And Mrs. Stuckman has probably already pounded in your head with Levofloxacin. Your patient has a great ch chance of a uh, tendon rupture. Fluoroquinolones are known to treat infections for gram-negative bacteria. This includes urinary tract infections, respiratory infections, and skin infections. You see a lot of this given with UTIs. Um, Dr. Cockrell, who's the urologist at Hannibal, prescribes a lot of ciprofloxacin. So just be aware of that in your practice. We don't want to give these patients who are pregnant or lactating or have renal dysfunctions. Most common side effects you'll see are headache, dizziness, 
insomnia, and depression. The most common one I think of, though, with fluoroquinolones is they're at risk for Achilles tendon rupture. rupture. They can also develop a yeast infection and experience some GI distress. When we're giving this med with other medications, we want to avoid antacids. And we also want to not give it we want to give it with antacids, the effect of the fluoroquinolone is decreased. So they should be taken about four hours apart. When we give this with theophylline, it leads to increased theophylline levels. As a nurse, when you are giving fluoroquinolones, you need to perform a physical assessment. You also want to include a good mental assessment to establish a baseline for this medication because sometimes they can have central nervous system effects. We don't want to give this to children under 18 because of the Achilles tendon rupture. We want to avoid antacids or iron or milk and dairy products shouldn't be given at the same time. So we want to wait four hours in between them. Um, this is a prototype summary, and this is probably the most common quinolone, fluoroquinolone that you'll see. And it's also cheap and on the generic market. Phenylmethylene was discovered in the 1920s by Sir Alexander Fleming. This was the first antibiotic used. Some types that we see today are penicillin G, amoxicillin, and ampicillin. Penicillins today interfere with cell wall synthesis and kill the bacteria. They treat gram-positive bacteria. Um, we use these a lot for pharyngitis, streptococcal infections, pneumococcal infections, staphylococcal infections, diphtheria, anthrax, and syphilis. So just be aware that's out there. These can be given prophylactic against bacterial endocarditis for dental procedures, which I've mentioned that before. When our patients are taking these medications, um, we need to be aware of the NSAIDs can have an effect along with when they're taking an oral contraceptive, the oral contraceptive is not working as effective as it should. And if they're taking warfarin, which is a blood thinner, they're going to have increased bleeding times. When we think of our patients taking penicillin and penicillinase resistant antibiotics, we need to assess for their allergies. We need to get a baseline of their skin and mucous membranes in case they develop any rashes or that furry tongue. Lab their respiratory status. We also need to assess their abdominal and renal function because if they're already having nausea and diarrhea and they get more from taking penicillin, we need to encourage them to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. And take the oral dose with water and monitor the patient. 30 minutes after giving the first dose because they could develop an allergic reaction. Amoxicillin is a common antibiotic we give for respiratory infections. Um, I've never given it post-exposure prophylaxis for anthrax, but that could be possible. And you just want to watch for that nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. When we give sulfonamides, another type of antibiotic drug class, um, we this inhibits the folic acid synthesis. Um, it's often combined with another antibiotic to fight against both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria. This is also most likely used to treat urinary tract infections or upper respiratory infections. We want to make sure our patients aren't allergic to thiazide diuretics when they receive this because it can cause birth defects as well as um, if the patient is, 
breastfeeding and on the thiazide diuretic, it can cause diarrhea and rash in the infant. Also, we want to watch this with elderly patients because it can have a change in the central nervous system effect and makes the elderly more at risk for falls. When our patients are getting this, they're at risk for side effects of GI symptoms. The renal effects, because of how it's excreted or filtrated through the kidneys, plays in part. Our patients, they can experience anemia and thrombocytopenia with their skin. When you take a sulfonamide, you're at risk for photosensitivity and dermatitis, so you want to educate your patient to wear sunscreen. It can also have effects in drug-to-drug -drug combinations. It can make the um, patient, if they're a diabetic and they take an anti-diabetic medication, it can give them the risk for hypoglycemia. And with chlorpyrifine and cyclosporins, or actually just with the cyclosporin, it can cause, increases the risk for nephrotoxicity. When our patients are getting sulfonamides, we want to assess allergies, especially to sulfonamides, and include thiazide diuretics because it, you know, can cause, if our patient's pregnant, it can be cause birth defects, as well as if they're breastfeeding, it can cause diarrhea and rash in the infant. So we want to make sure our central nervous system is good and intact. We want to educate them about wearing sunscreen. They should be educated to drink at least two liters of fluid a day so they're not at risk for dehydration. We want that drug adequately absorbed through the body. That's why they're drinking those two liters of water a day. An oral form should be taken with food or milk to reduce any GI symptoms. Also, some other consideration is you want to do a good GI assessment because of the nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. You want a renal function test because they're at risk for nephrotoxicity. You want a complete blood count, which includes WBCs, your hemoglobin, hematocrit, and platelet count because they're at risk for anemia and thrombocytopenia. This prototype of cotrimoxazole, um, we give a lot for acute otitis media in children. Tetracyclines um, are medications that we use today and they've changed over time they increase absor absorption currently in tissue penetration. Um, organisms become resistant to these so we have limited use of tetracyclines. Common ones that we use today are tetracycline and doxycycline. Tetracyclines we use a lot today for um, mycoplasma pneumonia, E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus. Um, we've used this today for common use of this today is for treatments of acne and uncomplicated GU infections caused by chlamydia trichomonas. Contraindications, we should not use this when children are younger than eight years of age because they can have damage potentially to their bones and their teeth. We also want to limit use with hepatic or renal dysfunction patients because it becomes concentrated in the bile and excreted in the urine. Mostly our patients um, have GI problems with this, but we don't want to use this with patients under the age of eight. Um, tetracycline has a strong affinity for calcium, so it can lead to discoloration of permanent teeth and tooth enamel. It can also do this with children and in fetuses. It can also lead to super infections, which is a possibly a yeast infection because the normal flora in this part are also being destroyed. When we think of drug-drug interactions, when we give tetracycline with penicillin G, it, um, the penicillin effectiveness of penicillin G decreases 
Um, when we give this with patients taking oral contraceptives, they should be advised to use an additional form of birth control while taking tetracycline. There's a scenario on page 123 that you could look at that discusses antibiotics and oral contraceptives. When our patient's on digoxin, which helps with heart contractility, um, we need to monitor our digoxin level through a blood draw because the dig level typically rises. They need to take this medication on an empty stomach or two to three hours after any meal. Nursing considerations for patients receiving tetracyclines, we want to assess their allergies and do a good physical examination along with a respiratory status. We want to educate our patients, again, taking that medication one hour before meals or two to three hours after meals. We want to avoid milk products and any iron preparation or dairy products because of the drug binding, so they need to take this medication also with six to eight ounces of fluid. My antimicrobials are given to treat pathogens that contain tuberculosis or leprosy. They hold a stain even though the presence of the de-stain agent, such as acid. They're called an acid-fast bacteria. These cause serious diseases. Common medications we see with these are isocyanide, rifampin, and streptomycin. Um, patients who are on tuberculosis medications might be on combination drugs. Mycobacterium libra causes leprosy, and it's characterized by disfiguring skin lesions and destructive effects of the respiratory tract. Leprosy is a worldwide health problem. Also, rifampin is an anti-tuberculosis drug used a lot. Antimicrobials, um, they treat the TB and leprosies, and they're always used in combination to the affected bacteria because the bacteria is at various stages, and it also decreases the emergence of resistant strain. We want to be alert for patients. Um, if they're pregnant, we need to weigh the benefit over the risk. The adverse effects, they might have some central nervous system effects along with GI irritation. With the CNS effects, they can have dizziness, headaches, they complain of hallucinations or drowsiness. Patients can also note that they um, have orange tin urine, sweat, and tears. It can stain the clothes permanently, so just be aware, educate your patient on that. And when giving these meds together, it can increase the liver toxicity, so you want to do liver enzyme studies. With patients receiving antimicrobials, you want to do a good physical examination that focuses on the respiratory tract and integumentary tract. Because of leprosy, they're already going to have maybe some lesions, so be aware of that. You also want to focus on renal and hepatic disease and CNS function. Next, I'm going to talk about antibiotics that don't fit into the large antibiotic classes. These are typically new up-and-coming drugs, drugs, and they work in unique ways and are effective against um, specific bacteria. So they're just kind of going to be broad statements. When you think of ketaloids, um, Ketec is the only one that is key. Ketec is the only one in the ketoloid group that's approved, and it treats mild to moderate pneumonia. These other groups of antibiotics treat large and severe infections.
And they're, remember, they do pass into breast milk, and they're excreted by urinary feces and metabolized by the liver. Remember, with all L antibiotics, you want to assess allergies first. You want to check their kidney and liver function. You want to make sure the patient's not pregnant or lactating. And with side effects, you want to keep in mind your central nervous system, GI, and they're also at risk for super infections. When talking about drugs of the other antibiotics classifications, you need to remember that they do interact with other medications. So remember to think of your NSAIDs um, and other, it can interact with other antibiotics. It can also interact with foods containing tyramine and your MAO inhibitors. So just be aware of that as you practice. It also interferes with warfarin at times, can increase their bleeding time. Um, nursing considerations for these patients, you want to always assess allergies. You want to assess their renal and hepatic disease. So if they're like coming into the ER or to the doctor's office and they're an elderly patient, you always want to check baseline lab work of your BUN creatinine, your AST, your ALT, and do a good physical assessment. You also want to order a culture and sensitivity on where you think the infection is, if you think it's that you're in the urine, or get a sputum sample if you think it's respiratory. Um, also, you want to assess temperature as your primary vital sign to detect infection. If they have a fever, their, fight, their immune system is fighting something. I already mentioned the liver and renal lab values. You also want to get a baseline EKG to make sure there's no cardiac changes when they are hospitalized. Telithromycin is also known as KTEK, K-E-T-E-K, -E -E and it treats community-acquired pneumonia. And when you give this medicine, you don't want to use this medicine with lipid-lowering agents, such as your anti, your cholesterol-lowering agents, because it can have a serious effect. It also affects your digoxin levels. Clindamycin or cleosin, I also have this on another page, so I'll hit those highlights on that slide. But this one is a lincosamine, and they are similar to macrolides, but are toxic. They're used to treat severe infections when a less toxic antibiotic can't be used. They're rapidly absorbed in the GI tract. When you are taking clindamycin, it's used for chronic bone infections, GU infections, and intra-abdominal infections. And then I'm going to talk about um, another one we can talk about is Zyvox lin linozolide. It's a newer class, and it's used to treat VRE. It can cause hypotension, and it can also cause serotonin syndrome, which you learned about last week. Year, semester when you take it with SSRIs and avoid foods with, that contain tyramine such as turkey. Flagyl you'll see used on gastrointestinal patients and gynecological infections. This treats anaerobic organisms. Um, it does contain several drug interactions so just be aware you'll see this in your clinical practice. And another one you'll see is macrodantin which is primarily used for urinary tract infections. And you just want to watch the renal function. The drug kind of concentrates in the urine. These are usually well tolerated on patients who um, keep well hydrated. So hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. I couldn't see where your book talked about vancomycin, but vancomycin is like one of the best drugs on the market to treat for staph infection or MRSA. So it's a natural bacteriocytic antibiotic, and it destroys the cell wall. It treats MRSA, like I said. You want to monitor blood levels with this to make sure it's therapeutic and prevent infection. Patients with vancomycin can experience ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. Another side symptom they can have is red man syndrome, and I'll talk about that on the next slide. Patients on vancomycin, you want to monitor their IV site closely. 
when the IV uh, vancomycin medication is infusing, patients can experience what's called red man syndrome. Their face becomes flush. They itch all over their head, neck, face, and upper trunk. Their face is just beet red. And the physician can order antihistamines to reduce the effects. You want to encourage your patient to drink at least two liters in 24 hours to prevent nephrotoxicity when they're receiving vancomycin. And vancomycin can be detected in blood levels, so you want to order troughs and peaks to make sure that the patient's getting a therapeutic dose. Erythromycin is a macro lid along with Zithromax or azithromycin. And these are used for treating streptococcus pneumonia, upper, river, upper respiratory infections. Um, they can also be used prophylactic. Here's your prophylactic drug before dental work in high-risk patients with valvular heart disease who are allergic to penicillin. They can give topical macrolids for acne. And really, you just want to be watched for increased digoxin levels if the patient's taking dig. They can very few side effects with macrolids, which is nice, but they'll complain of your nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal cramping. Another one we're going to talk about is Azactam, which is a monobactam antibiotic. It fights against negative, gram-negative enterobacteria, so it's good for urinary tract, skin, intra-abdominal, and gynecological infections. It's only available IV and IM. And you want to use cautions with this one if they have penicillin or cephalosporin because of the cross-reactivity. And they complain of mild side effects, local GI effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. May increase your liver enzymes. There's always new antibiotics coming out on the market. Um... Daptomycin, also known as Cubicin, that's used to treat complicated skin and soft tissue infections. So just remember, there's always research is always being done to develop new antibiotics to affect emerging resistant strains of bacteria because the bacteria is always mutating. Um, the Daptocin is given seven for seven to fourteen days IV over thirty minutes. The phytoxomycin or difficid. It's the new drug that came out in 2011 to treat C. diff. It's a narrow spectrum, so it's only focusing really on one thing. It can be given orally. Um, tigacycline or tigacil is another new antibiotic. Um, it's given to treat skin and skin infections. I think we use a lot on like, um, Patients who have um, soft tissue or bone surgery on their feet, I think, is when we give that a lot. It's given IV. So just be aware that there's new meds always coming out and always in the works by the pharmacies. And medications for to get new class of antibiotics, they're expensive, so be aware of cost. In conclusion, there are lots of antibiotics on the market. And antibiotics work by disrupting the protein or enzyme systems within the bacteria. They can cause cell death or they can prevent multiplication. Um, and you're going to be tested over all of these meds, which I know is lots of studying for you, but it'll help you in the long run. And make sure now that we have gone through all these adverse effects from medications, that you're putting them on your nursing care plans for that you do for clinical. And I suggested a helpful way to study is flashcards. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me or Dr. Moss. I'll volunteer also to help with antibiotics. Thanks for your time and thanks for listening.